Hi, this video is to help you um, get started with your project in terms of data. And we talked about using Postman, um, and that will help you to get familiar with the API and the, and the parameters and, and get a good look at your data. But this will take you one step further and have you test out your, your API in view code to make sure that you're not getting any cores errors or to kind of do a little bit better check on how this API behaves in the browser because keep in mind that APIs um, running between servers can there's no course interaction there there's no cross-origin type of checking or security issues it's completely handled through authorization whereas when you're in the browser if the server does not provide a header to allow for cross-origin resource sharing then your browser will not be able to access it and you'll see that error in your browser and so I like to do both steps of this and this is kind of what I would do if, if a student came to me with an API and so it's good for you to just learn how to do it too um, and so the way I go about it is I I will just grab one of my projects that I had running so here I've got Watts 4000 the using API project and um, you can see also we can take a look at this that you'll that you'll see come up now and then. Um, so GitHub is constantly reviewing its uh, repos and accounts repos for security problems, and there can be a lot of security issues, especially I've seen with Webpack. So when you see this yellow line, such yellow bar, sometimes it can just be a minor security problem that won't affect running your code. Um, or using you know using any of your your libraries, but sometimes it can be serious, and I like to clear these up. So we'll look at how we can do that. One thing you can do is you can look at the security alert itself, and you can see that this is the Webpack bundle analyzer giving me a problem, and that's Webpack. So that's all involved in the building of the static files, you know. So it's not really affecting my the code I'm running directly, but I still might need to clear it up. And you know this is an ongoing issue that you're going to be working with when you're working with JavaScript libraries. So if you go into that you can see it tells you um, one way to fix this is you could add this webpack bundle analyzer to your dev dependencies. I wouldn't add to dependencies because it's not part of your project, you know, it's not part of your own code that you're delivering. It's part of your build process. So you could add that in your package JSON. That's one thing you could do. But I'll show you one other way that I, I do it to um, to help clear that up. So Let's take a look at that. The way, so the way I get going with this is I don't want to clone because I'm really um, not going to be changing this particular repo, but I just want to grab this code. So what I do is instead of clicking on you know this this uh, address and cloning it, I just click on download zip. And what that does, you can see, is it puts a zip file in my downloads folder, download directory. So what I want to do now is uh, just find that folder and unzip it. This is a Mac. If you're on Windows, you'll probably have to do an extract all. Once I've unzipped it, then I'm going to open it in VS Code. So you could open VS Code and open folder. Or I've just got this service set up here. So um, once I get that, so here's my Rhinosaurus. Um, and we know we've seen package JSON, that package that we've seen that we have that security error. And so we might want to do something to take care of that. So one thing I'll do is view I know is changing all the time. So I set these repos up at the beginning of the quarter. So even in the time of our quarter, there have been lots of changes going on. So I might do an npm install save view at latest. And you can see right here I'm at... 2.5 and this one if there is something newer will get me the latest view and the little carrot this is this uses semantic versioning and the little carrot says get me the latest but don't go into the next major version so we have major minor and patch are the three levels and that carrot means something special so it did that um, and you can see it took my view up to 2.6 um, but it's telling me I have 17 vulnerabilities, some high. I could run npm audit and kind of look at them, but quite honestly, uh, there's a bunch. It's going to be a bunch of libraries that I don't really know that much about, and I don't, I don't want to spend time on that. So one other thing I can do is I can this package lock JSON. 
locks down all of my versions. Even with semantic versioning, you won't get the upgrade with the lock on it. So what I do is I delete that package JSON, and then I also just go ahead and delete node modules because I don't want to. I I don't want any of. I don't want any interference. I just wanted. I just want it to look at my package JSON. So no package JSON, package JSON, and just try to use all the semantic versioning to get me the latest code. So I'll just do npm install, and this will. Now, if you did, if you were starting from fresh and you were doing a view create like we did in assignment two, and I recommend you go back and do that, you know, to remember how that works, uh, you should get all the latest. So you shouldn't run into any old versions. But when you're grabbing an ex some existing code, and you know, you may down the line have to do this to bring some code that you wrote up to speed that's in your, um, you know, it's in your portfolio. So now you can see I'm at zero vulnerabilities. Um, and when you run npm install, it always recreates package lock. So now it's just locked down at higher levels. So that can be one way to, this works to deal with getting the latest code and removing those, those security problems. Okay, but what we're really here to do is to uh, look at how we can test our code. We'll first look at code in Postman, and then we'll look at how we can test it in our code. And so I'm just going to use Rhinosaurus here because I've got some code all in place here and I know if I if I run this server, so npm, is, npm run serve, if I run this development server here, um, I will have I will have sort of a little framework here in place that when I, you know, type in ham and test and hit search, uh, it's going to go out and run. Oh, we, we have that one strange little cores error here that we have to get around. So we'll just disable that, run that. Okay, so now when I run, let's see, ham test. Oh, shoot. Uh, let's see. So we have our disable cache. Ham related to test. Okay, there we are. So still still giving me this this network error. Um, seems to be working now. Okay, so we get this running, we deal with that particular quirk from data use and then we we're get we're running so what i know is is that whatever i whatever api i hook up to this git when i click on the button that is linked to this fine words so when i click on um this the basically the submit button that is going to run that api i sort of have some code in place so i'm sort of like doing a shortcut workaround quick and dirty way to get something running so let's say I go, I'm out here on Postman. I've got my Pokemon code. I'm using the Pokemon API. Um, I've got my Pokemon call and I'm expecting to get back lists of Pokemon characters. Got it set up with Git. There's no key or API to deal with in this, in this, uh, this API. So I just hit send, it goes out. And when I get back, is it tells me there's a total count of 964. But what I'm getting back is the first 20. So if you look at the numbering here, each one of these is a Pokemon character. And this happens to be the detail on that Pokemon character. So if I, if I open up that, it will show me all the detail on that. But, um, or if I wanted to take that and open up a new, a new URL here. Oops, that's not what I want. Um, go back to this Pokemon. If I can get this in my buffer, this should give me the detail on my Pokemon character. So yes, so here we have the detail on Chlorophyll, I guess. That's their ability. Bulbas Bulbasaur. 
so yes, yeah, so we are dealing with, so this is kind of what I've kind of tried to bring a, make clear is that a lot of data works in terms of you get back a list of, of a bunch of, you know, sort of a summary of, of your data. And then there's some detail attached to it. So when you're designing your views, you want to kind of match that. So you'll have one view, maybe when you load the page, when the user clicks on a button that gives you your summary list. And then when, the, and then when you render that as a template, and when they click on one of those items, you then go out and call, you know, open a new view for the detail, and you go call the API associated with the detail. Or sometimes you can hand that detail off through props to your second view. But anyway, this is so we've, we what we're all we've done here is we said, okay, great, we got this running in Postman. We kind of understand how it works. It's going to give us 20 at a time, and and if I wanted to get the next 20, I could I could use this next URL and make another call, another API call, and it would get me 20 through you know 39 or something. So I got a good understanding of my data, but I'm not sure whether this data is going to work in the browser. So the next step is I'm going to grab this URL, go to my code that is kind of set up to call these APIs, and I'm just going to run it with Pokemon. And then there's no params on this, so I'm just going to take that params out. And now I'm ready to run this. So what's going to happen is it's going to run. If it works, it's going to return the response data. It's going to go into this results. And I've got this big old set of templating going on. I don't really care about that now because I'm not interested in any of that data. That was all the Rhinosaurus uh, data. What I really want to do is just see, does this response return? So what I'm doing is I'm just going into my template. I mean, I could remove all that doesn't really matter. And in between, so what defines the template is the template and then the, the outer div. So that, that anything in between there I can bind to, right? So what I'm going to do is down here at the bottom before the closing div, I am just going to set up a mustache with and just bind the whole response. So I, whatever, or actually what is this? It results is what it is. Let's see, it's coming back results. So we've set up, you know, results in our data so we can refer to it internally as this and anything referred to as this that's part of this instance I can bind up in up in here. So basically all I'm doing is I'm taking my my API, my base URL and the any endpoint. So this is the full base URL, the Pokemon endpoint. I'm setting it up in a get call, and then I'm going to bind the full results to that get call. And the way I'm going to trigger this call is just by hitting that search button, because hitting that search button calls find words. That will call my API. So here I go out here, and we seem to be in some kind of a... Okay, so let's re refresh this. So now I hit search, and what do I see? What I see is the results that I saw in my postman. I see it bound to that results um, mustache in view. And because I'm getting these results back and they're landing on the page, I feel good. This is going to be a good API. I'm not seeing any, any cores errors down here in the console. Everything looks good. So this is a really good API. Let's take a look at another API that's a little more, has a little more parameters and see how that could work too. So I have this API that, let's go back to Postman. Um, so this is an API for a site called Ed Edamom that looks up nutrition and recipes. And so um, this one happens to require an app ID and an app key. So I've registered, I've gotten my app ID and app key for the recipe site. Um, it lets me specify a certain type of diet I'm on. And this is all just reading through their API docs. And I have a query parameter where I can say I want things with an oat in them. You know, I want something with oat in it. So a recipe with oat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the endpoint here, which is the base and the word search. And I'm going to copy that into my 
git command. This is a git. Um, and then I am going to have some params here. So let's say I have params. Okay, params. So I set up my params key. And now I'm going to grab params out of here. So I have q out. So we'll say down here q oh, and it's got to be a string. And then we'll have the next one will be app ID. So app underscore ID. And we'll put the, this is just uh, IDs given to me by the application when I registered. Don't use my IDs, you know, even though you're seeing them here. It's, it's, you really want to get your own IDs and get that going. But um, just to make this clear, I'm just using my ID. So app key, and it's a string. Oops, don't want that. Want the value. So a string there. And then I do happen to, I am using this diet param, so low carb is my value. So you can see there's a few parameters here. Now I'm hard coding these here. If you had a form set up, say a form where you ask your user, okay, what kind of a recipe do you want? You know, enter a string, you know, for this recipe in my form up here, kind of like what we did with data muse, this would not be a string. This would be a this dot q or this dot user food choice you know when th i'm only hard coding it for in order to show you how to set this up but the app id and app key would be hard coded um and the but the diet in the queue could be user entries or selected from a drop down list or some kind of form um, entry um, you could also do as we did in the refactoring and pull this um, pull this URL, uh, this base URL, and the app ID and app key out into a separate file like our API.js in refactoring. And then you would just call get and the endpoint search and give it the additional parameters, boat and diet, or queue and diet. But anyway, that's how that's set up. But once again, it's going to run. It's going to put the data in the results. And my results are bound to this page. So if I go and hit search, uh, you can see here it's returning the recipes used for oats. OK? So then, you know, of course, you'll that's kind of hard to analyze and look at. I think it's easier to look at the recipe down here. And you can find, you know, you can study the, the data and figure out uh, you know what you want to actually show your user based on whatever choice they make so in this case um, you know we have a lot of data here and I would probably spend a little time you know analyzing exactly what I want to do with all this data but in any case it shows you there are a couple of different ways that you can do that okay so now what do I have so I've got this file uh, this downloaded package it's not connected to GitHub at all. You know, if I say Git, it's not even a Git. There's no Git involved here because when you download, you just completely cut off Git. But if I wanted to save this, um, all I need to do is go out back out to GitHub and click on the plus sign and just say, you know, hey, I want a new repository and give it a name. Um, my project, you know, any name you want, meaningful name, that's not very meaningful, um, but, you know, say this is your final project or something. So this could be the beginning of your final project. I'm not saying that this is the only way to start a project. You could also start from scratch like we did in assignment two. But, you, you know, this, this definitely is moving you in that direction. So I create that repository, and then GitHub gives me some instructions for pushing and I won't need the README, okay, because I've already kind of got that all, I've got a README in this project that I downloaded. Um, but I do need to run get init. So once I run get init, that's going to create a local repo. So get status. You can see it, it all of a sudden recognizes I've got files that have changed. It creates this git um, directory, this hidden directory, dot get, you know, any dotted directory is hidden. Um, and 
So I'm, I'm, I've now got a local Git directory. Um, I, next thing I need to do is a git add, and they show git add readme because they told you to add one, but really you can add everything. So I'm just going to do git add dot. And so now I'm in staging. So when you do the add, you move to staging and everything turns green. And then the next thing that I can do is I can do my git commit. So git, git commit dash n. I could call it first commit or start project or you know anything I want. Um, I'm still local though, right? Because I um, I haven't hooked myself up to this remote repository, but this command here, just copying and pasting, will hook me up to that my project. And there I am, um, get status, and um, I should be able to push now. So I push this to origin master. You can see it's pushing, and I am now ready to. Um, if I go to my project, I can see I just pushed all of this stuff. So I actually have kind of the beginning of a project here. Uh, however, I'm not going to keep this. So what I'm going to do right now, I'll just show you if I wanted to delete that. Like let's say I created it, and I thought I don't really need this. I'll just go to this delete repository under settings and enter my project. But this kind of just refreshes your memory on working with GitHub to create projects and push them up. But anyway, the important thing is I'm able to say, I'm able to feel really comfortable that my API and my parameters are going to run in the browser and return some data. So that was that. I hope this helps you. Um, please ask questions on Slack if you, if you have any. All right.